Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, give me a call. The number is 208-991-4783. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, I do want to... Uh, Encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up a copy of my ebook. All I needed to know, I learned from Columbo. It's now available in the Apple Store. So if you want that for your iPhone or uh, iPad or iPod, it's available there as well as for Kindle. And uh, you can also get it at smashwords.com and other formats. Uh, and all I needed to know, I learned from Columbo. We take a look at Seven great detectives of radio, television, and literature, including Sherlock Holmes, Nero Wolf, Columbo, and Monk, and we take a look at life lessons that can be gathered from their histories. It's, uh, it's a fun read, and it's available uh, as an ebook. so I encourage you to pick up your copy today. All right, now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, The Alan Saxton Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Stanley Mitchell Dollar. Oh, how are you, Mr. Mitchell? I'm fine. Are you employed? No, not since last Tuesday. Then you can take an assignment. Fast as you can give it to me. Go to New York and see a Mr. Alan Saxton. He recently returned from Europe where he purchased a supposedly priceless painting. Applied to our company for insurance on it. You said supposedly priceless. Is there a doubt? Yeah, big one. Several experts have examined the painting, claim it's a forgery. Saxon yelled foul all over the place. He paid 200000 for the article. Well, I do a little yelling myself. A whole group of experts are going to give the painting every test there is, and if it stands up, we're obliged to insure it. And if it doesn't, I leave before Saxton comes to a boil. Huh? That's about it. I'll get right on it, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat, chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Great Eastern Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alan Saxton matter. Expense account item one, $21.65, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at Grand Central late in the afternoon and went directly to a hotel where I registered and made arrangements to rent a car. Saxton resided in a quaint three-story house on an estate across the river in Jersey that looked impressive enough to be an annex to Fort Knox. An old cad butler met me at the door and led the way into a mahogany and leather study where I was left to wait for the master of the house. Mr. Dollar? That's right. <coughs> Glad to know you. Mitchell of your company called, said you'd be down. Yes, sir. Well, sit down, sit down. Have a cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Mm. 
Aren't you a little premature? How do you mean? Well, there'll be no positive confirmation in my painting till after it's been examined, you know. When will the examination take place? <laughs> nasty cough. Yeah, nasty. Well, I'm to turn the painting over to Mr. Uh, Farmer from the museum tomorrow morning. I imagine he'll have it for a day or so. I understand you paid 200000 Yeah, I, I sure did. 200000 fat American dollars, Mr. Dollar. Have you any idea how long it takes to make $200,000, Mr. Dollar? Well, that kind of depends on who's making it. Yeah. Me, I start getting senile around a buck ninety-eight. Oh, Lord. If I keep hacking like this, I'll end up doing business in an oxygen tent. <laughs> You'd like to see the painting, Mr. Dollar? Sure. Yeah, come on. Mr. Dollar, if I've been swindled, I'm going to cause more trouble than a hungry snake and a rabbit pet. Who'd you buy the painting from? Who? One of the biggest, most respectable dealers in Paris is all. You ever been to Paris, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. In here. How about that Paris, eh? Oh, I rather enjoyed myself. <laughs> I, I rather did, too. <laughs> Yeah, I've been there a dozen times now, and I never get tired of anything. Not anything, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> the last trip I You're met... a terrible old man. Huh? Oh, Barbara. I didn't see you. Hello. Hello. This is my impish daughter, only child, spoiled rotten. Barbara. Johnny Dollar. Just going to show Mr. Dollar the painting. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't really like it, do you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I really don't know much about it, Miss Saxon. Barbara. You don't care for it, Mr. Dollar? Well, I... I guess it's very good. Good! Dollar, that's an original Marshall! Marshall! Oh! They're beginning to call Dad the hacking sack. <laughs> yeah, hacking sack. Nasty little brat, isn't she? Who told you the painting was a forgery, Mr. Yeah, Saxon? A miserable little man named Lipper fancies himself an authority. Just jealous of what he is. Give his right clavicle for that painting. Ran around telling everyone how old Saxton got taken for 200 grand. Miserable little cousin. Are you going to be in town long, Mr. Oh, Dollar? Oh, stop rolling your eyes. That's about as crude as... And that eye rolling went out with high button shoes. Uh, who did you say sold you the painting? You look out for her, Dollar. Get that tone. Are you going to be in town long, Mr. Dollar? I want to know. Uh, the painting? Uh, I bought it from René Francois, most reputable dealer in Paris. He's only going to be in town till after they establish my painting to forgery. Isn't that right, Dollar? Uh, who? Uh, René Francois? You! I'm doing my best to save you from this designing female. Now, agree with me. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm only going to be in town until after... And he can stay after... for dinner? He cannot. Why not, Mr. Dollar? Uh, well... Because uh, we haven't got enough food. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Now you go on back to wherever you're staying, Mr. Dollar, and I'll get in touch the minute they finish with the painting. Now, take my word for it, Dollar. Quit while you're ahead. Stick around for dinner, and you end up a cripple. Oh. Well, are you going to stay for dinner? Not, Mr. Dollar. He is not. Seems like a nice fella, but he never played polo in his life. How about it, Dollar? No, just an occasional game of stickballs. What position? Oh, mostly gutter. Wonderful. I was a gutter man <laughs> myself. You were raised in Hell's Kitchen, Mr. you know. Mr. Dollar, please stay for dinner. No! You can talk over old times. Bring back the good old days when you were out cracking skulls. You were going to leave. I am. I show Mr. Dollar a Saxon's word is as good as his bond. Her bond. I'm a her. her she. Yeah, her. Sometimes I wonder. Come on, Dollar. I'll walk you to the door. You don't have to drag him. Dollars. Goodbye, Miss Saxton. Please. No! Look out! Ah, getting better, but you're putting too much of a curve on it. I hate you. <laughs> Come on, Dollar. You're quite a girl, huh? Yeah. There's nothing really wrong. Just spoiled. Got too much money. I'd ask you to stay, but you really seem like too nice a fellow. Well, uh... Well, uh, what? Just well. At the moment, that's about as glib as I can get. I left the Saxton house 
shook my head a few times to get my brain turned around, and drove back to New York in my hotel. There wasn't much for me to do until the experts examined the painting. So I showered, shaved, got dressed in my other suit, and called a few numbers I'd collected during several investigations to see if I could get what looked to be a dull evening back on its feet. I struck out three times and was dialing the fourth when... Yeah? Come on in. Hello? May I come in? Well, uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. I hope I didn't interrupt an important call. No, no. Sit down. Thanks. Where's Daddy? Oh, he wouldn't tell me where you were staying, so I found out who he was insured with. I had to call his lawyer. Then I called your insurance company. Oh, I'm flattered. I'm determined. Daddy's liable to spank. I don't think so. He's really not the general he tries to be. He blusters and lays down the law, and we butt heads. And you get what you want. If it's important enough. Well, I'm sorry I spoiled your record. You haven't. Well, then my staying for dinner wasn't important. Oh, yes. Very important. Well, then you lose. Mm-hmm. If you can't fight them, join them. Well, that's a practical bit of philosophy, but I don't see quite how it applies. I've had no dinner. Uh-huh. You wouldn't accept my home-cooked invitation, so now it's going to cost you. My expense account just turned yellow. Where would you like to take me to dinner? Where would you like me to take you to dinner, shy Violet? Maybe I'm not the most conventional type in the world. I'll go along with that. But I don't want to argue. I don't want to have to coerce you. I don't want you to do anything you don't really want to do. You just want me to take you to dinner? It's a nice way to start off an evening. Yeah, You'll take me to dinner? Johnny? Expense account item two, $22.78, dinner at a small Italian restaurant. I'm pretty sure the dinner was excellent, but I'm positive that Barbara Saxton was more woman than I'd run into in a long time. Delilah was a Girl Scout by comparison. We got back to the Saxton home in Jersey about three in the morning. Parked the car at the front door and said good night. I had a wonderful evening. Will you call me tomorrow? Right after my two o'clock shock treatment. Weren't you happy? Well, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I think we had a little too much to drink. Who had a little too much to drink? Okay. I had a little too much to drink. You're fractured. <laughs> I love you, Johnny. Let's get married. Come on, dear love. Oh, I don't want to go in yet. I want to get married. Johnny, let's drive to some place where we can get married. No, I'm once more a clear-thinking, cautious bachelor. I can fix that. Now, while I'm conscious. Want to bet? Oh, come on. Be a good little girl. Get out of that car and let me walk you to the door or I'll scream for help. You're mean. The word is coward. Yes. Now, come on, dear. No. All right. You're right. You're a coward. But a single one. Now, come on. Kiss me goodnight first. Barbara. Kiss me goodnight or I won't budge. I'll kiss you goodnight at the front door. It's a deal. Where's your key? First. Now, honey. You promised. The front door. This is it. Go, front door. Okay. Good night, honey. Let's get married. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Now! Shh! Now! Honey, the door was open. I don't want to go in. I'm not going to go in. Barbara, look. No. I'm going to sit right down here. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, that's nice. Carry me, Johnny. Carry me to a minister and let's get married till death do us part. There. You're on your own. Good night. Johnny, you come back here. You can't leave me just standing here like this. Drink a big glass of milk and get some sleep. Johnny. Good night. <laughs> what the? Johnny! Oh, Johnny! What is it? What's wrong? In the library, Dad! What? He's lying there. It's all bloody. 
friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working, you can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Barbara Saxton was hysterical. I had a slapper to calm her down. Then together we went into the darkened Saxton house where I found her father, Alan Saxton, lying on the floor, bleeding from a nasty scalp wound. He's all right. Call a doctor. Oh, come on, come on. Mr. Saxton. You can't stop him. Don't try to sit up. The picture. You all right? Yeah. What happened? Oh... Now, you better stay right there till we get a doctor. Oh, just sit up. Oh, oh my head. Oh, well, it doesn't look too bad. There's a lot of blood. <sighs> my painting. Now, just take it easy. He got it. Look, it's gone. Okay, okay, but don't try to get up. It might be a concussion. No, he stole my painting, cut it right out of the frame. Who did? I don't know. A man. I heard something and came down. Servant's night off. Shouldn't have been anyone down here. What'd he hit you with? A little flashlight, I think. Doctor, I'll be right over. Dad? Traitor. I thought you were dead. I couldn't be. I'd feel better. You deserted me. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, stop that. I'm the one who got clobbered. You nearly scared me half to death. Well, I couldn't help it. What happened? Some dirty lowlife swiped my painting. No. Well, look. Marshal. Yeah, caught him in the act. Would have captured him, too, but he crowned me with his flashlight. Better get some hot water and a towel. But they have to take 50 stitches. Well, it's just a little cut. It is not. It's good for at least 50 stitches. Dear love. Yes, dear love? Get the hot water and a towel while I go call the robbery detail. Yes, Johnny. Wait, wait. Yes, dear love. Yes, Johnny. He took me to dinner. Well, it's 3.30 in the morning. 3.35. What day? Tuesday. What time do you finish dinner? Look, while you're getting your suspicions up, the thief is putting a lot of miles between dollar, this house and dollar, the... Dollar, answer me one question. She didn't get you drunk and get you to marry her. I sure tried. But you didn't. No. Yeah, you're a lucky boy, Johnny. Oh, don't look so smug. You just think everyone wants to marry me for my money. Well, don't they? Not Johnny. I'm going to call the police. Wait, wait, wait. Just one more question. If you married my daughter, would it be for her money? In the first place, I'm not going to marry your daughter. Johnny. In the second place, if I did, it wouldn't be for her money. See? If I was going to marry her at all, it would be for your money. Johnny! <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Barbara got a towel and some hot water, and I called the police. I stuck around while old Saxton gave his heroic side of the incident. Then I took off and drove back to the hotel, where I put in a call to the Paris branch of the company. I talked with Howard Gilbert and asked him to check on the departure of René Francois, who, according to Saxton, wasn't expected to arrive in the States until late that afternoon. There had to be a good reason why anyone would steal a painting that had been publicized as a possible fake. Saxton wouldn't have the painting stolen... Because without insurance, he'd just be out the 200000 he'd paid for it. René Francois might have a reason, though. Because if the painting was proved a forgery, his reputation would suffer. Not to mention having to return the 200000 to Saxton. Well, Gilbert promised to wire the information regarding Francois's departure the minute he had it. And I left the hotel and headed across town to see an old friend. A continental stool pigeon with a way of knowing about such things as... Stolen $200,000 paintings. It was close to 5 o'clock when I rang his doorbell. Whoever it is, you're just being ridiculous. 
I let you warm. Henri, open up. Not by the hair of my little goatee. If I owe you money, come back at a respectable hour. It's Johnny Dollar. I don't believe it. Only my landlord or, or a vampire would go to such extremes. Look, Henri, I'm going to slip a little something under the door. Uh, another ten might come with me. Okay, but you'll never go to heaven. I'm convinced. Mon ami, <laughs> entre, entre. <laughs> uh, I miss you, Johnny. Are you that broke? Well, until this windfall, I was completely fractured. But, um, what can I do for you? Some information. Eh uh, bien, bien. Mais, is this so important that you must seek me out before the, the sun has risen? You ever heard of a Mr. Alan Saxton? Saxton? He's been in the papers. Well, a few hours ago, someone hit him over the head and swiped a very expensive painting. Oh, is that the Saxon who recently purchased the supposed uh, Marshall? That's the one. Well, there was some doubt as to the authenticity of the painting. Experts were going to examine it today. He paid 200000 for it. Two? Marshall? Yes. I would have painted him something far superior for, for much less. Who do you think would pull a job like that? Well, what is so special about a job like that? Break into a house, steal a painting? An amateur could handle it. No, no. It's a special job for a special talent. The thief knew his Marshaux. There were a lot of other paintings in that room. Well, but he could read, couldn't he? Marshaux certainly signed the work. Or if it's a forgery, whoever painted it certainly signed Marshaux's name. This painting wasn't signed. That's one of the reasons why there's some doubt about it. Uh... Not only that, but why would someone take that painting when it's worthless until proven authentic? Mm -hmm. You have a point. I'm thinking of a European. Oh, Johnny, I wouldn't touch a job like this. Someone with an international reputation. Please, Johnny, I am innocent. Mon ami, please believe me. Someone who could possibly be hired in Paris, or if he happened to be in the United States, could be contacted. Someone that would know this particular Marshall and be qualified to break into the Saxton house. Henri? Wait, wait, wait. You have that knowing look. Well, I, you know, I was just thinking about my landlord. Yeah, sooner or later, he'll trap me. It's the law of average. So far, so far, I've cleverly avoided this ingenious... How much? Uh, pardon? How much do you own? Oh, a paltry two months rent, uh, forty dollars. Okay. Yeah, but, but what sense is there in paying when it will only provide me with a legal claim to this disgusting dwelling? And I have no sustenance to keep me alive for longer than a week. Well, then just pay him for a week. You would have me starve? How much will keep you alive for two months? Well, I, I would at least like to take care of a green bomb delicatessen. Ten bucks? Well, the, the exact amount is, uh, uh fifteen... Oh, you're lucky I've got an expense account. <laughs> you think I don't know it? <laughs> All right, who is he? Well, you might go to the Shelton Arms and inquire about a man named Gaston Chambre. It has been rumored that he arrived from Paris only yesterday. Who is he? Well, that is for you to discover. There are certain things I am bound by honor not to diverge. But any policeman in the world could help you out. <laughs> I left the little Frenchman and went back to my hotel, where a cable was waiting from Gilbert at the Paris office. It told me that René Francois had booked passage on Air France and was due to arrive late in the afternoon. I left, climbed into the rented car, and drove to the Shelton Arms on East 108th Street, where a sleepy night clerk gave me Gaston Chambray's room number and accepted a $10 bribe not to inform Chambray that I was on my way up. Cable for you, Mr. Chambre. Oh. It's from René Francois. How do you know that? I peeked. You are not a messenger boy? Sure I am. I've got a message from René Francois. Then give it to me. He says to give me the painting. Oh. oh. Uh-uh. I'm coming in. You have no right to come in. You got something to hide? Get out of here before I call the police. Oh, no. I'll just stick around. 
But if you want to call the police, why don't you go right ahead? Maybe you'd like to tell them where you were earlier this morning. I was right here in my room. I have been in my room since early last night. You didn't take a short trip over to Jersey? I certainly did not. You arrived from Paris yesterday, huh? Yes, but what has... Oh, police. You are a policeman. I'm surprised you didn't decide that when I pushed my way in here. I have done nothing. But you know René Francois. Yes, but I know nothing about a painting. Now, look, I know all about you. Of course, but you can't prove anything. You want me to tear this apartment to pieces, or do you want to hand over the Marshaux? I told you I have no painting. I just said Marshaux. That could be something you shampoo your hair with. If you mentioned a painting, then Marshaux, any fool would know they are one and the same... As for your tearing my apartment to pieces, as you so crudely put it, I think you would be making a serious mistake. Really? You have no warrant. Well, now you're making a serious mistake. Uh, really? I don't need one. You're still going under the assumption that I'm a policeman. You, you are not? No, not a bit. All right, get up. Now, where's the painting? Who sent you? I sent myself. Now, where's the painting? Okay. No, no. Wait a minute. It's it's under the pillows on the couch. Uh Uh-huh. Why did you steal it? Maybe you didn't understand me. No. All right. I was hired. Sure you were. René Francois? Yes. Okay. Now, as long as you're so suspicious about policemen, put on your clothes. I'll take you downtown, introduce you to a few of the gentlemen in blue. Gaston Chambray gave a complete confession to the police. He'd been hired by the Paris art dealer, René Francois, to steal the painting, had been discovered by Alan Saxton, and in order to make his escape, was forced to clout the old boy on the skull with his flashlight. René Francois was met at the plane and, when confronted with the evidence, readily confessed. He explained that when the Marshaux was proclaimed a possible forgery, he realized that if it really was, his business would be ruined, and he would have to return the 200000 to Saxton. He checked with the sources that had originally sold him the painting and discovered that there was a strong possibility that the painting was a fake. He offered Chambray $10,000 to do the job. He'd arrive in the States after the robbery, offer his condolences... Meet Chambray at a predetermined spot and take the painting. Well, Saxton took it in stride. And after Francois gave him back the money, he even laughed about it. <laughs> you really did a fine job, Dollar. I'd like to make it worth your while. Well, it'll just cost you the $85 I paid out in bribes. <laughs> The rest goes on the expense account. Oh, you look pretty bad. (laughs) Terrible hangover. Don't be mean. You're responsible for this. You got my 200,000 bucks for me. It was that Francois. He was behind the whole thing. Some guy named Jim. Well, don't you want to hear about it? Johnny, will you take care of me? I need somebody to take care of me. Oh, dear love, I'd love to. Really? But I've got to get back to Hartford. I can be packed in an hour. Oh, there you go with that eye rolling again. I'm not rolling them. They're rolling themselves. I have absolutely no control yeah. whatsoever, Johnny. Dear love. Yes, dear love. Can I go with you? Uh, no. Why not? Well, I'm an insurance man. What's the matter with that? Oh, nothing. Only I know a bad risk when I see one. Johnny, I'm not a bad risk. No. But I am. Ah, I bet. Ah, here, have a cigar. <laughs> Expense account item three, $55.85, hotel bill and car rental. Item four, $19.65, train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $119.93. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps you keep feeling fresh and alert. 
The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum every day, and we know you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Edgar Barrier, Hal March, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Uh, this was a quite enjoyable episode. It was nice to see Johnny have a solid uh, rapport with uh, somebody uh, he, uh, he's meeting on the uh, investigation. This was a Blake Edwards script. And Edwards, you know, he did this on Richard Diamond, and I couldn't find any, uh, like, clear evidence that this was a Richard Diamond script originally. And those of you who are more uh, Richard Diamond aficionados may have listened to one later on in the series that I've not quite gotten to. But uh, this was a great story. Love the rapport between Johnny and the old man. And just some of the fantastic characters they had there. It's just classic Blake Edwards. And uh, I guess I can be glad for Johnny, too, that uh, he did not end up getting uh, married. Well, the way she was acting was a little cute. The only way you can... Uh, get away with that as if you've got really good looks, but uh, probably would not have been very cute after a couple months of marriage. Uh, but I uh, really appreciate uh, just the overall script and how Blake Edwards is always uh, able to create this kind of interesting hybrid with uh, general hard-boiled perspective, but a lot of humor uh, as well. Well, we turn now to listener comments, and Michelle says, Hi, Adam. I've been enjoying Pete Kelly's Blues, always a Jack Webb fan. Why so few episodes? Well, it's a good question. Uh, there are two-part answers. First of all, we have a total of six episodes that are lost. There were a grand total of 13 broadcasts. Only 12 uh, transcriptions. They re-ran one. So we're missing six. The broader question of why so few, this was recorded in 1951, when Jack Webb was in the midst of doing Dragnet. This was all, always intended as just a summer replacement series. And because, you know, and it was, you know, definitely popular. Some people do kind of make a mistaken assumption when they see a radio series where not a whole lot of episodes uh, were made that, you know, there was something wrong with the series. There wasn't anything really wrong with Pete Gully's Blues. It was always just intended to run for 13 weeks, and it did. Uh, Webb was doing Dragnet at the same time, so he was doing two radio series, and he was about to get into a television series. So even if he'd had the opportunity to uh, extend it, uh, I doubt he would have. You know, and it's something uh, you know I've run into in radio. It was not my experience growing up when I saw uh, w when I saw television growing up. You know, shows would just go away for the summer. This idea of summer specials, you know, you know or summer series just was not a factor. Uh, it's kind of come back a little bit with reality TV. But back uh, during the golden days of radio, some shows would go on vacation and they would have series that would come on just for the summer. And sometimes a summer series would be popular enough to be, to be picked up. And Dragnet was actually one of those. It was just a summer replacement. 
But with Pete Colley's Blues, Jack Webb already had a series, and uh, in December of that year, he would uh, star in the first television episode of Dragnet, so it was just not an option to continue it. But Webb definitely remained inspired and loved the series, uh, loved the concept, and was able to get it made into a movie, and later a, a television series that had a short run um, in uh, the late 50s. All right, last comment we have here from Josh, who says, Hi, Adam, I love these podcasts. I just wanted to let you know uh, the Natalie Masters was on an episode of Adam 12. She played Katie Anderson in the season four, episode number seven, Truant. It's on Netflix. Thanks so much. And uh, Natalie Masters uh, had a, a long career as a television character actress. Um, I've, I've seen her in quite a few episodes, uh, and perhaps the weird thing is I never quite think of her as Natalie Masters and make the connection to Candy Manson, just because that was such a, a different role, such a, a very uh, dynamic and sassy sort of role. It's very different from what she uh, ended up doing in Hollywood, which a lot of character character actresses, matronly roles, things of that sort. All right, well, that will do it. we finished another week of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. I want to thank all of you so much for listening. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about some potential um, changes uh, in the show, uh, maybe adding an additional week. I'll talk to you about that on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we've got to, to welcome on Monday Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Or excuse me, Frank Race. Barry Craig, of course, done this week. We'll be back with Frank Race on Monday. And then join us back here again on Friday for yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Send your comments, Box13 at GreatDetectives.net, Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, call us, 208-991-4783. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.